Martin. Thank you, thank you. All right, good morning, Asbury. It is so wonderful to be with you in worship this morning. Um, as we were singing these songs, I thought to myself, I'm glad that we're not shy about lifting up the blood of Jesus. It's the blood of Jesus that makes us whole. It's a little bit scandalous sometimes, a little bit awkward sometimes to, to sing about the blood and to to say that's what we base our faith on. But we're a strange community as Christians. We're an odd community that, that stakes our, our hope in life on the idea that somebody else had to suffer for us to bring us into God's presence. Um, I'm going to read a scripture today uh, from Acts chapter 9, verses 10 through 19. This is Acts chapter 9, 10 through 19. And in this story, the Christian community had been suffering for their faith in Christ, and Saul had been causing them to suffer. Hear these words, beginning in verse 10. You can follow along in your pew Bible or on your phone or however you read the scriptures these days. It's on page 1090 in your, in your pew Bible. Now, there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen a vision, he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry out, to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we give you thanks for your holy words that you have shared with us today. And God, we give you thanks for your word come to this earth, Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to to hear today how we are to be in community and help us to reflect you everywhere we go. Lord, be with me as I share these words. Help us each to get that piece of your message that we need to hear this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So what's happening here in the background of Paul's baptism story is that the Christian community is not sure if it wants to accept this man named Saul. Uh, It's not sure if it wants to let this man become one of them. And Ananias here represents the rest of the community making this decision. And for good reason, they were hesitant because just a matter of days before this story, He was persecuting them, throwing them in prison. Saul was even a party to the execution of the first Christian to die for his faith, St. Stephen. Have you ever seen the Christian community struggle to accept someone? I have. I remember when my friend John Paul got saved. JP was a punk kid, a rebel. He dressed and acted differently from everyone else and caused a little bit of trouble. And that combined with the additional trouble that everyone seemed to suspect him of being about to cause led to a reputation of distrust. But then JP went to church camp one summer and accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and came back a completely different person. He was still a nonconformist, but whereas before he didn't believe in God and he thought that religion was just something that people made up to keep unruly teenagers in line, now 
suddenly he was all about Jesus and he was all about telling others about Jesus. I remember the reaction, however, of our mid-sized Methodist church uh, in Altus, Oklahoma, and that reaction was confusion. They just weren't sure what to do with him. Now, some people were very happy for him, of course, the more spiritually mature and open-minded among the church, but he was never quite fully accepted. And I, I hate to say it, but I think it had just been too long since our church had seen someone born again in Christ. The, the Baptist church across the street, on the other hand, was happy to take him in and disciple him. So he eventually became a Baptist pastor, and JP's one of my best friends to this day. But if, if we want a more public example of the Christian community struggling to accept someone, my friend Stephen White made this suggestion to me the other day. It would be Kanye West. For those of you who don't know Kanye, he's a hip-hop, art, hip-hop artist with a flamboyant ego. And he's the husband to Kim Kardashian. Kanye has recently declared himself to be radically saved. And he's just released an album called Jesus is King. Jesus is King. In an age when many Christian musicians avoid wrestling with core theology, and then many musicians also drift slowly from Christianity to secularity and are embarrassed about their faith, such a straightforward message is really striking. The the struggle to accept Kanye has to do with his reputation. He's known for posing as Jesus with a crown of thorns on his head on the cover of Rolling Stone and for comparing himself to God in his song lyrics, not to mention a lot of profanity and vulgarity. Kanye has been, you could say, a walking illustration of lust and pride, which makes him, you know, a sinner, just like all of us. And sinners can be saved. And that's who Jesus came for. People like my friend JP and Kanye West and Saul of Tarsus and you and me. Once we know Jesus and are born again, then we all need to be held to a higher standard. And we all need good teaching from the word of God. And we all need to grow in holiness. But first, we all need to be given a chance. Today we're finishing up a sermon series based on David Brooks's book, The Second Mountain. As Pastor Tom drew for us last week, there are four main areas of life in which we can find something beyond success, something called significance. And those areas are vocation, marriage, faith and philosophy, and community. And really, all four of those areas must blend together in our search for significance. Our core beliefs, who we are in Christ, affects how we live in our marriages, and it affects how we live in our vocations. And so in the same way, who we are in Christ will affect how we live in the community around us. Brooks defines a healthy community as a thick system of of relationships. A thick system of relationships. So what does that mean? Thick relationships are relationships with people who really know you, who know who you are and where you come from. They know what kind of trouble you got into when you were a kid. They know how to get a hold of your parents if you're causing trouble right now as we speak. And while that might be inconvenient for you when you're causing trouble, it's a really good thing when you're in trouble, because these same people will help you get out of trouble. And then a thick system means there are a lot of these relationships. A child or youth in a thick community is not dependent on just one or two parents or one mentor, but has several mentors and role models in their life who can speak into their life at opportune times and in ways that they will understand and which will stick with them. There's a great book called Sticky Faith, which many of our youth leaders have read. And in that book, they call this group of mentors the five. The idea is that we would reverse the idea of five students to one adult, and we would say five adults to one student. And that would get the whole body of Christ investing in our next generation. And then for vulnerable adults, that is people who are frail or sickly 
or disabled. In a thick community, that means they have uh, several friends and neighbors who know their patterns and habits and where they might be expected to be on a particular day of the week and people who know their needs and are happy to meet them. In a thick community, neighbors help each other. And I don't mean just helping in times of extreme crisis, but habitually, as a matter of course. Brooks tells a story about an Israeli couple who had moved to an affluent neighborhood in Southern California. The husband was away for work and called one night to chat with his wife. After they'd hung up, she went to check on their four-year-old boy. He wasn't in his bed. She frantically searched the house, unable to find him. She ran to the pool to see if the worst had happened and he'd fallen in. He hadn't. She bolted out of the house and ran up and down her block, screaming his name at the top of her lungs. It was about 10 p.m. Lights were on in some of her neighbor's houses, but nobody came out to help. By now, she was terrified. She ran back inside for one last search of the house and found her son in the family room. He had built a fort with some cushions and was sleeping peacefully underneath it. The next day, she was out walking, and a few of her neighbors politely asked her why she'd been screaming her son's name at the top of her lungs in the middle of the night. She looked at David Brooks with incredulity as she told this story. What sort of community is it where people don't help a mother find her son? In Israel, she said, the streets would have been flooded with people in their pajamas out frantically searching. And that story struck a nerve with me. I value privacy as much as the next American, but I want to live in the kind of community where my neighbors can come to me for help and where adults and even kids can go to each other's houses and knock on the door and walk in and it not be seen as strange. Which reminds me of my old next door neighbor, Bill Thomas. Bill worked at Altus Air Force Base with my dad. They played tennis together. Our families went to church together and we were next door neighbors. So Bill's family and ours naturally became good friends. Actually, it's a small world because Bill's son, Jeffrey, who was a few years ahead of me in school, is part of Asbury and helps in our student ministry and our kids' ministry. And Jeff's wife, Lisa, works upstairs in our finance department. Actually, when Christine and I got here to Asbury, there were several people from different chapters in both of our lives that were here to help welcome us. And I've put that up to either... God's special providence in our lives, making this plan for us, or it's just such a big church that when you come here to Asbury, you're bound to know somebody. Has anybody else had that experience? But now 30 years later, I have friends, and I have tennis buddies, and I do know my neighbors, but I can't say that I or my children have anyone in our lives that's quite like Bill Thomas. That's because Bill used to come over to our house to chat frequently, and he had his own special doorbell ring. Ding dong, ding 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 dong, which some people might find annoying, but it worked for us. My sister and I would always get excited when we heard that doorbell ring because it meant that Bill was going to come in and start teasing us. Sometimes it would be in the afternoon when everyone was getting home from work or school, or it might be at night while we were doing our homework, or he might come over on Saturday. Uh, He would come to chat with my dad about uh, local politics or something that happened at work or, or at church. But when he saw us kids, he would always give us a hard time. Um, We would act shy, but we loved it. So I I remember when I turned 10 years old, Bill said, Oh, James, so I hear you've become a teenager. I said, What? And he said, Yeah, you're 10. And that's a two-digit number. And 10 sounds like teen, you know, you're, you're a teenager. All right. And then... I started taking karate, uh, martial arts, and as I was getting closer to becoming a black belt, Bill would, would uh, say to me whenever he came over, hey, so James, have you registered yet? I was like, what do you mean registered? He said, well, well you know, you're, you're a karate master now, and so your arms and your legs, those are deadly weapons. And you can't just walk around with those things. You've got to register them, which is a total myth, by the way. And I knew that he was full of it. But it did sort of make me feel accomplished. Bill just made life more fun. 
I knew that he and my dad were very good friends, and they must have had some serious conversations, but for me, he was my local comedian slash encourager, and he added to my community. Bill passed away too young and is no longer with us, unfortunately, but I can still hear his jovial voice echoing from many occasions in my youth. We had some other great neighbors in that neighborhood on the edge of Altus, Oklahoma. There was... Bill's wife, Sandy, for starters, who once bound up my finger when I got a nasty wasp sting. I was home alone one afternoon playing wall ball, throwing a tennis ball against the side of my house, and that was back when it was normal to leave your older elementary kids home alone. I, I threw the ball against a wasp nest without realizing it, and then I ran right up to the wall to tag the wall before one of my imaginary friends threw me out which sounds really sad now that, I, now that I say that. But I promise I had real friends too. I was practicing for when I played with my real friends at school. But so I ran right up to that wasp and got stung. It hurt really bad. My parents were not around. And so I looked around, what am I gonna do? Who's gonna help me in this situation? I went next door, knocked on Sandy's door, and looked, stood there and looked pathetic and whimpered, and she took me in and put warm water and baking soda on my finger and a Band-Aid, and I was good to go. And then there was my neighbor across the street, Rich, and I don't even remember Rich's last name. He wasn't as talkative as Bill, but he was a nice guy, and he had a cool pickup truck. And sometimes Rich would actually give me a ride to karate class on Saturday mornings. Not regularly, but sometimes when both my mom and my dad were working, or when one was working and the other was out of town. You see, we thought it was normal to actually do things for your neighbors and to not feel bad for asking your neighbors to do things for you. As I was reading these chapters on community in the Second Mountain, I surprised myself with my reactions. You know, I found myself getting downright emotional. Something hit home with these stories, especially when Brooks said, In these kinds of communities, which were typical in all human history until the last 60 years or so, people extended to their neighbors the sort of devotion that today we extend only to family. Did you get that? You might think he's exaggerating a little bit, but I think that's basically true. For most of human history, people extended to their neighbors the sort of devotion that today we give only to our family, if to anyone at all. And this change in society can be seen everywhere, from farm country on the one hand to urban tenements on the other hand and every kind of suburban place in between. 100 years ago, or even 50 years ago, they all used to have thicker systems of relationships than what seems to be the norm now. Think to yourself, think as far back as you can uh, to your childhood memories. Think about stories that your parents or grandparents might have told you about neighbors helping each other. Think about books that you might have read. I don't know if any of you have read any Wendell Berry, but he's one of my favorite authors. If you want to read some good stories about neighbors being there for each other through the years, read Wendell Berry. But so, so do you think this is true? Uh, if so, what, what do you think has brought our culture to this point when we forget what real community is supposed to be like. I don't have all the answers to that, and neither does David Brooks, but it's a start to identify uh, that there is something we're lacking. And if you read the book and the rest of the chapters, he goes into some suggestions for how we can build that kind of community. But here's another one of my favorite quotes uh, from chapter 23. Community life, that is care for one another, is built on friction on sticky and inefficient relationships. I love that idea, inefficient relationships. Because when we make life too efficient and boil it down to just the necessities is when we miss out on meeting and knowing actual people. Relationships happen when we're not in a big hurry to get from point A to point B. Now, to to give an example, I, I really don't want to judge people that use grocery delivery, because my wife and I have been known to do that a few times. But you know, as, as you get your groceries delivered, as you incorporate these new time-saving technologies into your life, we just need to ask ourselves, what are we saving time 
for? I thought that was a really good question. That was Tim Otley's question when I told him about my sermon. What are we saving time for when we're trying to constantly save time? Is there still room in our lives for just running into people and chatting so that on down the road, we have some friends? Another excerpt which caught my eye was in reference to the bewildering array of programs aimed at helping individuals who are born into poverty and hardship, which often involves getting those individuals a great college scholarship, which then amounts to a ticket out of their community. And there's a problem with that, which Brooks points out. It doesn't do anything to help the communities themselves, but it just sort of skims the cream, as he says. With this approach, you're not really changing the moral ecologies or the structures and systems that shape lives. Now, depending on your politics, you might be tempted to get suspicious when you see a phrase like structures and systems and think that he's talking about overthrowing capitalism and the free market or something crazy like that. But remember, David Brooks is a conservative, at least for the New York Times. So that's not what he's talking about at all. The structures and systems that Brooks refers to are relationships. And the way that you bring healing to more people is to bring healing to their communities rather than just to individuals. Healthy structures and systems mean relationships where you are known and loved by your neighbors, which allow you to strive, to thrive in your life and community. Healthy structures and systems means a kid grows up in a stable environment with a neighbor, Bill, who gives them a hard time, a neighbor, Sandy, who can patch up their wounds, and yes, a neighbor, Rich, who can give them a ride in his pickup truck, provided he is known and trusted by that kid's parents, of course. I know what you 21st century people are thinking. We have to be careful. Unhealthy structures and systems mean that the environment around you tends to make you feel isolated, lonely, and unknown. It's not about capitalism or socialism or any other ism or an ailment of the political left or the political right. It's an ailment of humanity that humanity is prone to, but it seems to be worse in our time somehow. People starving for community. I'm telling you, friends, look around. Look around where you live, where you work, where you shop, and even right here at church. And you will see people starving for community. I I think we need to ask God for eyes to see these people and a heart to love, and then courage to act, courage to help. So back to Saul and Ananias. Thanks to a vision from the Holy Spirit, Ananias obediently accepts Saul into the community laying gentle hands on this man who had laid violent hands on the community just days before. At that moment, something like scales fell from his eyes, and then he got baptized. Isn't that something? Saul had seen a vision of the Lord Jesus himself on the road to Damascus, back in the beginning of chapter 9, and Jesus had given him a personal revelation at that time. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul had said, Who are you, Lord? And Jesus then said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Do you find it a little odd that Jesus says, you are persecuting me? While Saul had never even met Jesus, Saul found that odd. That's because Jesus identified himself fully with his sheep, with his saints, his little children, his brothers and sisters, his community. What Saul did to them he was doing directly to Jesus. But by the grace of God, Saul's life was about to change completely. He would now become a servant of God and build up that very same community. And so it is very significant that that Saul did not walk away from that first meeting with Jesus, a completely changed and functional man. No, his, his change was still incomplete because he couldn't see. It was not until his baptism when the community opened its arms and accepted him, that Paul became completely whole. Now he was in Christ. Now he was whole. And then what happened? 
Well, in Acts chapter 9, verse 20, Saul immediately started preaching Jesus in the synagogues of Damascus. People were shocked and a little weirded out by it, naturally. This guy had just been causing havoc among the people who invoke the name of Jesus. And now, all of a sudden, he was one of them. The apostles at Jerusalem were suspicious, too. But then his friend Barnabas shared Saul's conversion story with them. They accepted him as a brother, and they let him continue his ministry. And then the narrator, Luke, summarizes the results of the ministries of Peter and John and Stephen and Philip and the newly converted Saul. In Acts chapter 9, verse 31, the church had peace and was built up in Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. We only see a glimpse of the early church in this particular story, but the whole book of Acts fleshes it out quite a bit more. And you can see some of that if you're reading along in your sermon journal. The book of Acts shows us that the church, for all its many flaws, is about the thickest community out there. The church, as the body of Christ, should be a thick web of relationships, which brings security to every member, young and old, strong and weak. So how is your web of relationships this morning? What are your relationships like in your physical neighborhood where you live? And how about here in the church? Certainly, we can all wish that we had more and better supportive relationships. But to find them, we need to make certain investments. I want to lift up a few practical ideas for, for you on how to invest in a strong web of Christian relationships for your family. And if you're currently uh, raising children, this will bless them as well. So, First would be to find yourself a discipleship community. Um, a lot of what I'm going to be doing here at Asbury is, is supporting our existing discipleship communities and starting new ones. Uh, right now we've got about 30 different discipleship communities which meet concurrently at all three of our worship hours as well as one on Wednesday evening. In a large church like Asbury, it's sometimes easy to be anonymous. You all know that. Um, but when you're in a community, you can't be anonymous. And that is a good thing. Because communities are where we live out our Christian discipleship with people who know us. Uh, our communities learn the Bible together. They care for one another. They serve in God's mission together. There are a lot of reasons not to be in a community. But I can tell you as a pastor who's been in a few churches and seen people come and go, if you get connected with a discipleship community you are much more likely to stay connected to this local expression of the body of Christ and much less likely to drift away because that's how communities work. They bind people together. We do understand that there are, there are a lot of folks who can't fit a community into your schedule and some of your reasons are good. Like if you're really involved in our music ministries or our hospitality ministries or volunteering with our youth and kids. And for that reason, we try to make those, those music ministries and those service groups the kind of place where you can make good friends and form a thick web of relationships as well. We hope that our Asbury ministries are places where you can make those connections. There are different levels of community. Um, you can't get to know a group of 2,000 people like you can get to know a group of 150 people. And you can't get to know a group of 150 like you can get to know a group of 40 or 12 or 6. And for that reason, we have something else called small groups. Small groups have always been a vital part of Christian discipleship, especially of our Methodist movement. Most of Asbury's small groups are actually organized through our discipleship communities, while others are available through our young adult ministry and our men's ministry and United Methodist Women and several other groups here and there. It would be difficult to catalog all of the small groups at Asbury, although I plan to try, um, because some of them are unofficial and many were formed decades ago. But that's the nature of a, of a big church. But the important thing is that people find one another and stick with each other as the Christian life progresses and the years go on. Finding the right group can certainly be a challenge, but I promise you it is worth it. To see me up here talking about discipleship communities and small groups may look a lot like a church advertisement. If you're comfortable just coming to worship, it might sound like I'm pushing extra activities on you, 
But remember Saul at his baptism. He didn't become completely whole until he became part of the community. Remember the woman running around her neighborhood frantically wondering why no one would help her. She knew that something wasn't right in that situation. That's not the way it's supposed to be. It's normal to feel lost or disconnected when we don't enjoy a thick web of relationships. It can be hard and awkward to forge those relationships, but it's worth it. If you've ever thought about visiting a discipleship community or looking for a small group, if you've ever had even a hint of the idea that the Lord might be prompting you to do that, then please let this be the day. I hope to have my inbox flooded this afternoon with people asking for help finding a community or a group. That's Jay Lambert at asburytulsa.org. When you reach out to me, I hope I don't disappoint you by not always having the exact perfect answer for every set of needs, but I will do my best to get you in touch with the right people. And then when you visit our communities, I hope that they don't disappoint you by being filled with regular people who might not always say or do the right things, but they are growing in Christ together, and they could grow more if you were there with them. Well, our our time draws to a close this morning, and soon our moment of corporate worship will end, but our community at Asbury will go on. We are the body of Christ, the same Christ that Saul persecuted, the same Christ who then sent him to start new churches throughout the Roman Empire. Jesus actually came to us to join our community as a representative of the original community, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, together forever. That's the mystery of our faith, that he came to draw us up into that eternal community so that we could take part in it. And as Christians, we get to be a shadow and a reflection and a preview of that community here on earth. So let us strive to live truly connected to God and connected to one another. Let's do that in our neighborhoods and in our church. Let's treat our neighbors as family. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. The band is gonna lead us in a final song. And as we do that, as always, you're invited to come to the altar, to speak to God, to listen to God, to say, Lord, Where are you calling me today? How do you want me to invest in community? And any other prayer need you might have, there will be folks up here. And if if you want prayer, uh, we, we will pray with you. Let's pray.